everybody. I'm Michelle DeStefano. I'm a visiting faculty member here at Harvard helping um, do some things at the Center on the Legal Profession with Professor David Wilkins, who I'm sure all of you know. Um, we have these speaker series every week. We're really glad to have our guest today, Horacio Gutierrez. Um, so let me give you a little background on that, or, um, Horacio, and I say a little because if I really were to give you his full bio, we would take up all the entire talk. But um, the interesting thing about, uh, what, some of the interesting things about Horacio is he's got um, five degrees, four or five JD degrees, as many JD degrees as he speaks languages. And he speaks uh, English, Portuguese, Spanish, some French, and Italian. And that's how many degrees he has. He has a JD back from school in Venezuela. He has a JD from the University of Miami. He has an LLM from Harvard Law School. He has an advanced degree from the same school back in Venezuela. And um, interestingly, his, his career, is, he's been a lawyer. Uh, he's been in private practice. He's also worked in the banking industry, um, um, uh, not in a legal capacity. And he's, he was at Microsoft for almost 18 years in many different positions, um, including innovation and IP, and also some more um, uh, political positions all over the world. So um, Horacio really has a very varied career. And as you know from the poster, he has just recently taken a position as GC of Spotify um, as of last Monday. So be kind when you start asking questions about the culture of Spotify or the strategic plans or whatnot because um, he has only a week under his belt so far at Spotify. And we're going to hear from Horacio today about um, the changing role of lawyers in house. And as you all know, over the last 20 years, it's changed dramatically. And um, Orasio has a ton of experience working in house. But here's what we're going to do today, a little bit different format. So we're going to start with a presentation by Orasio that actually he gave uh, about 10 days ago to Microsoft. So he had the, the fortune, the great fortune, of, um, of, of being so well liked that they actually held a big, huge party. And the whole entire corporate and legal affairs, or at least over 500 people, it's a big Corporate Legal Affairs Department at Microsoft came to hear Horacio tell his 10 lessons learned uh, of being, about being an in-house leader at Microsoft. And we thought that would be a really great setup for this talk. After 18 years in-house at Microsoft plus years of private practice, what has he learned about being a leader uh, inside a corporation? And then we're going to move to a slightly different format where I get to put Horacio on the hot seat and ask some difficult questions. And then we'll go to questions at about 20 till. So um, we'll definitely save a lot of time for you to ask tons of questions. Again, though, being kind of nice to him, given that he only has five days at the clock. Thank you, Michelle. And, and thanks, everyone. Um, it's, you know, I think it's interesting in the conversation with Michelle, we decided that I was going to start with this because we can talk about the subject matter issues, the legal and regulatory and policy issues that that we face, you know, these internet companies, the freemium model, the advertising funded business models, the international data flows, and the privacy considerations, and we'll probably get into some of those. What typically we don't learn in law school is how to operate and survive and thrive in a large corporate environment. And it takes a number of skills that are not necessarily the kinds of skills that we look for and develop uh, when people are uh, in law school. So after spending almost 18 years at Microsoft and have, being given this amazing opportunity to address the people that I had worked with, that's a legal department of over 800 people all over the world, then I spent some time trying to think about what were the things that I, that I really took from it. Some of them are my own observations, some of them I heard from leaders in the organization, some of them I read, many of them, the things that you'll see here, you can also find in Harvard Business Review um, articles about management and organizations, but the way I structure them and the way uh, the insights that I derive from them are really things that come from my own experience, and I thought that would be helpful. Um, so the first thing that, that I talk about, and, and it seems obvious, uh, but it's not when you're in that environment. In fact, is that the job description is only a starting point. You know, when you apply for a job in a company or when even internally when you move from one position to the other, they tell you these are your responsibilities. 
And obviously people initially are very focused on doing that particular job very well. But the reality is people that do well in organizations like that, they don't stick to the job description. They define their role and their potential for impact much more broadly. They look for connections and gaps and vacuums that need to be filled because they work in these huge organizations where there are so many silos of people very focused on their particular area of expertise that, that there's never enough people looking horizontally at, at how to look at the gaps. One of the examples is as soon as I started at, at Microsoft, I started in the Latin American legal office. I was based in Fort Lauderdale with, for Microsoft. Fort Lauderdale is the capital of Latin America somehow. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, the, the, I, I was there to do software licensing contracts and legal issues, deal with legal issues that happened in Latin America, but it became very clear to me that there was this amazing opportunity to help modernize the legal regime for electronic signatures in Latin America. This was the late 90s, and at the time, none of the legislations of Latin America really gave binding uh, uh, character to electronic signatures and electronic commerce was starting to pick up, pick up in Latin America and yet there was no uh, guarantee that the contracts that were formed electronically were going to be binding. And I saw that opportunity and I pursued it. Nobody told me to do it. I wasn't given resources to do it. I got together with people at Oracle and Compaq at the time and Hewlett Packard and the others and we came together and we did, we did it. And that kind of initiative, which you probably see more in law school than you might see in the corporate environment. That is the kind of thing that opens up opportunities for you. So that initiative is something that you need to carry into your professional life. The other thing when it comes to careers is, is something that I always say is you're the captain of your own ship. Your boss is not going to tell you how you're going to grow. Your boss is not going to tell you where you're going to be in five years. They can be very helpful. They can help put you in positions where you can develop experiences, and, and be exposed to things that are of interest to you that will round out your set of experiences. But ultimately, you are the one who needs to decide what kind of career you want to have. And that, by the way, changes all the time. When I graduated from law school, I thought I was going to be originally in Venezuela in 86. I thought I was going to be an employment, law, uh, employment lawyer. Um, then, in fact, I became a banking lawyer. Then I became a banker. Then I, when I came to, to Harvard to do my LLM, it was all about corporate finance and international finance and things like I remember Pound Hall, actually, I was saying yes, and as I walked into it, I had this flashback of Hal Scott uh, and going into the test of international finance, and that was like a nightmare. Um, and, and I thought that's what I was going to do. And then increasingly, I got involved in technology issues in my private practice. That's how I got into Microsoft. And then at Microsoft, I had to become an antitrust lawyer. At some point, we all had to become antitrust lawyers at Microsoft during a certain period of, period of years. <laughs> and then an IP lawyer, and then I headed the IP group, and all those kinds of things. Your career changes, in part because what, what is attractive to you changes. And nobody can tell you how you're feeling, and what are the areas that you're curious about. And, and you're naturally gravitating towards those, and picking up law review articles, and reading materials about that. So you are the one who needs to be in control. And, and even geographically, I started, as I say, in Fort Lauderdale, then I went to the headquarters in Seattle, then I moved to Europe and was in Paris for four years, leading the European legal department for Microsoft in the middle of the antitrust battles with the European uh, Commission. Then I came back uh, to Seattle to head the IP group, and then ultimately became uh, general counsel of the company. Those decisions, even though they required the support of people in the organization, the driving force, it was me. So you have to be the captain of your own ship. You need to set the course, chart the course of where you want to go. The other thing is, you know, and, and actually th these are words I live by, work can be fun or can be miserable. It's up to you. The reality is, when, like, like in law school, you're spending more time with your classmates and with professors than you are with your family. In the corporate legal environment, you spend hours upon hours with your colleagues, and you have to work late hours, and even when you go home, you're working at night. Sometimes you have to work on weekends. You spend so much time with your colleagues. And my philosophy has always been, well, why make it miserable? Why don't make it fun? And that, that has a number of implications for it. I think you know, one way I do it is I try to keep a sense of humor. And that, that's really helpful 
in the, in the most tense moments uh, to be able to do it. But the other thing is, you know, the relationships that you form. And, and you know, I, I showed a few pictures of things that I did um, over there. This is my, the, one of the teams that I had. These are the leaders of the, of the legal teams. These are the deputy general counsels who support each of the technology uh, product teams at Microsoft, being able to go out on a boat and, and enjoy, or, or a really interesting one. This was an immersion trip that we did to Beijing, and we took a Tai Chi class, and this is outside of Beijing, and that was really, really funny, because we had no talent uh, <laughs> whatsoever. But, but those are the things that you say, well, th you know, you have to develop relationships of trust with these people, you know, because you depend on their ability to perform, and they're depending on you. And building these networks and this connection is really important. That begins to tell you something about what it means to lead in a lar large organization. It is not just about your output and your ability to perform. It's not about your heroics in terms of getting things done. It is about trust. And it's about building trust um, in the organization. Uh, this is what uh, 5, 5K with, uh, that we do every year for charity. So <coughs> lesson number four. Leadership's everyone's business. There's always sometimes this tendency to believe that the people higher in the organization are the leaders and other people will follow. This may sound foreign to people in law school who, who are all in this mode of, of, of leading, but you get into the corporate environment and all of a sudden, you know, the hierarchical structure over time would tends, to cre tends to create certain patterns that are actually not really good. And, and what I always said is everybody, regardless of roles, regardless of level in the organization, they have an opportunity to lead. Because leadership is an attitude. It's the ability to see a problem and make the connections and establish relationships with others to try to get something done. To work with others that don't necessarily have to listen to you because they don't report to you and you don't have formal authority over them. But you've developed a relationship with the person and have been able to articulate a vision of a common goal that everybody can get around and, and, and get it done. And it doesn't matter if you're an administrative assistant, it doesn't matter if you're a business manager, if you're an investigator, if you're a government relations person, if you're a senior lawyer, a junior lawyer, or a paralegal, there's opportunity for leadership in every one of those roles. Number five, credibility is the foundation of leadership. People, people have to know that you are going, they, they have to see you act in a way that's consistent with the things that you preach. And, and you know, that means, you know, doing it, you know, doing it in your own life and doing it in the way you behave um, in the organization. So building that credibility, standing by your word, and, and over the years, people knowing that they will, they can expect from you what you say you will do, it's incredibly important. Without credibility, there's no leadership. Number six is you either lead by example or don't lead at all. And I mean, it goes back to the notion of you have to act in a way that's consistent with the values that you preach uh, for the whole um, organization. There cannot be a disconnect between the things you say and the things you do. Number seven, the best leaders are the best learners. The world is always changing. Technology is always changing. The competitive landscape is changing. There are you know, Supreme Court decisions and opinions by the FTC and the FCC and the European Commission and the data protection authorities and, and you know, all over the world. The, the, the world is changing and you always have to be learning. You have to be learning new things. So you know, I, I always talk about how in my career I actually never took my boss's job. All of my progression in the organization was somewhat diagonal. I took somebody, you know, a, a job in some other organization, and I felt that I had to, I had to become a new person. I had to reinvent myself as a lawyer uh, every time. And when I, I remember specifically when, when I was coming back from Europe, I had a conversation with my with my manager, Brad Smith, who's the, the president and chief legal officer at Microsoft, and. He, uh, he said, well, you know, we sent you to Europe for three to five years. It's been four. What would you like to do? And at the time, I had been working on issues related to the interface between intellectual property and antitrust. And there was this big legislative initiative in Europe, um, a, a software patent directive. And I was very intrigued by the IP issues. And I had done copyright licensing in my career. And I said, maybe I want to work in the field of intellectual property. 
And a couple of weeks later, he calls me and he says, well, the head of the IP group is retiring. How would you like to take over the organization? I was blown away. It was, I felt completely unqualified to take the job. And he, when, when we met in person, he actually had a stack of books for me on software patents and licensing and litigation and all those things. And I said, here you go, go learn. And you know, first of all, it's a unique opportunity for someone who can trust you that you're going to grow and learn uh, in that way. And it, it was quite challenging. I would say it probably took me a year to figure out what I was doing in that space. But, but once again, it's proof of the fact that you can. And I'm so glad that I did it. In, in a sense, everything that happened in that career, in my evolution as I went through these different fields, prepared me for the opportunity that I have now to lead the legal department of Spotify, where copyright and licensing issues are so important to their business model, but also our regulatory questions about privacy and about targeted advertising and all of those issues that we have to live with in the, in the online uh, services world. Yeah, the, you know, people don't make a name of themselves when they're leading organizations at the time of calm and stability. When the, the biggest leaders, the, one, the ones that we always think about, we think about them because of what they contributed at times of challenges and at times of difficulty. And, and that is absolutely true. And for the ability of a leader to stay calm but be decisive, and, 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 and be solid at a time of crisis. That is really what engenders the loyalty uh, of people in an organization. So it's not like you're gonna be looking to create challenges, but believe me, they will find you. And how you behave in situations like that is really the, the, the critical test of leadership. And this is one that people find, uh, you know, I, I, I actually find that people might rationalize, but they don't necessarily in, internalize. And that is that, Leaders are team players. In large organizations, people cannot achieve great things if they don't do it as part of a team. It doesn't matter how smart, how hardworking, or how good you are. The nature of the challenges that, that we face in the business world are such that you need the support of people who are litigators, and people who are privacy experts, and people who are policy experts, and you need to work with the communications team because many of these things have reputational impact. You have to be able to be part of a team, and you have to be able to do things for other, others. That means sometimes you lead and sometimes you follow, and it's, uh, the example that I use is like in, in basketball. It is important to know how to play without the ball. You need to be able to move when you don't have the ball and somebody else has it, and the team is not gonna work if everybody's standing while one person is, is dribbling the ball. Well, the same thing in the corporate world. You need to be able to be there for others, so when it is your time to lead, they will gladly follow you in achieving great things, and you will become better and analyze issues better and come up with better uh, results if you have the ability to work as part of a team. But we don't get trained to do that as lawyers. The way we grade people in law school, the kinds of behaviors that we reward, we're trying to measure IQ and the ability to learn of the individual and the output of the individual. We really don't train people to work in environments like that in which sometimes you have to take a step back and let somebody else um, you know, get most of the credit for something. We don't train them to do that, but that is to me perhaps the most important skill to succeed in a, in a large corporate environment is the ability to lead while being a team player and allowing other people to share the credit and to contribute and then to learn when to lead and when to follow. Those things are critical. And then the last one is, you know, the notion, the big surprise is that we're human. You know, the fact that we are lawyers and we work in a corporate environment doesn't change the fact that we are this network of human beings and that people have difficulties in their life. You know, people have bad days and they have good days and they have problems at home and they have problems with, with co-workers and the others. And, and I will never uh, forget, it, my wife was diagnosed seven years ago uh, with breast cancer. And as you can imagine, that was a tremendously difficult uh, time. And I remember the way my uh, manager handled the situation. I, I had literally just taken a new job, that's when I came back from Europe, 
And he told me, drop everything, go be with your family, take care of it. We're going to take care of everything for you. Just let us know if there's anything we can do for you. The loyalty that it generates on someone when the organization does something like that for you, you will never forget it. And that was a tremendous lesson for me as a leader. Because every time I knew of someone who had a similar problem or other kinds of problems, whether it might be because their marriage was falling apart or because they were having issues with uh, um, children who were, had addictions or things like that, the notion that you will never forget that you're human first and that we all go through those times and that you can be there for them at that time um, is incredibly important. And believe me, when they come back, they will do anything for you. They will work as hard as they can possibly do it and, and you will be able to rely. I certainly felt that way with my manager and I think over the years, uh, you know, I've tried to make sure that I behaved in the same um, in the same way. So never forget at the end of the day that caring about the people around you. I know it sounds very soft and you know all that kind of stuff. It, it's a human organization and it's about motivating people and engendering loyalty and cohesion and that is incredibly important. So those are you know the ten the ten lessons that I shared with the, <coughs> the department. It must have been somewhat successful because I got something like 20 requests for the copy of the slides to uh, to send them around. But I'll stop there, and then I'll, I'll transition to you, Michelle. Okay, so um, Horacio shared with me yesterday the, I'm not sure if it's a tagline or the essence of Spotify, which was something like, we're a technology company, but a music it's a technology company. company by design, music company at heart. And that's a great segue, because he was just talking about the heart. And um, so let's kind of dig a little bit into Orasio's heart and ask him the question probably all of you want to know, and this is how we made you stay, right? Lunch, and then this question, why did you go from being the general counsel at Microsoft to being the general counsel at Spotify? How, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I've been asked this question a few times, and, and uh, um, and in making the decision, I, I obviously asked myself the question. The, uh, the thing that really excited me about Spotify, and I, I had a fantastic career at Microsoft. I love the company. I, I love the transformation the company itself is going through right now under Satya Nadella's uh, leadership. Um, but I, 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 the opportunity of Spotify came up, and the combination of challenges and the mission of the company was so appealing to me that, that I almost felt the decision made itself. I mean, it is a company that is, it's a startup. It's beginning. I, I, I describe it as, it's the equivalent of, if I, had, I joined Microsoft in 1998, it's as if I had joined Microsoft in 1982, before the company became public and it was Bill Gates and Paul Allen and 200 other people. And I never got the chance to do that. I mean, they, uh, by the time I joined, the company was already very large. It was international. It was a public company. It was very successful. And even though I'm very proud of how I might have contributed over the years to certain aspects of the business, I, I wasn't part of the team that was building this new thing. Uh, and Spotify is at a stage in which I can still have a little bit of, my, uh, of that influence. Um, it's a company that's trying to really change the business model behind music. And it's trying to do it in a responsible way. It's trying to do it in a way that, that understands the interest of, of all the stakeholders in the music industry, and particularly the interest of artists, you know, in the short and in the long, in the long run. But it is also a technology company. It is, you know, it is a software company, which is something that I'm very familiar with. And it is also a, a company that you know, involved and, and over the years as an opportunity to be a leader in this data revolution. At the end of the day, the ability of Spotify to remain relevant is to, is to be able to personalize the service by understanding what the user wants and almost anticipating or what, what, it, what the user might want even though they don't know they want. And, and that whole notion of data analytics behind it and, and, and the ability to develop that in a responsible way, in a way that, that meets the expectations of the, of the users. That combination of things is just fascinating. 
And then behind that, there's also this policy element to it. You know, the copyright system, as, as it works today for music, is a, is, a, is a system that, you know, basically has been in place essentially for 100 years. And, and it was created for a time in which it was basically about radio, and you had to print the vinyl uh, records and print the covers, and you actually truck them to the DJs, and you had to cut deals with the DJs so that you'd play your song. And so there are historical reasons for why the system is the way it is, but it certainly has to evolve. And, and how it has to evolve will have a lot to do with the business models that are emerging. So we have a chance in Spotify and in the legal department as part of Spotify to be part of the conversation about how the model should evolve and where the music industry as a whole, all of us, involved in, in the music industry are going to evolve. So you look at that in those terms, and I, there was no way I, I could say no to it. As, as, as uh, fantastic the opportunity at, at Microsoft was, this was something that I was passionate about. So there's this great, great quote that um, is something like, I'm going to butcher it, but the sign of a good decision is the multiple number of reasons for it. <laughs> and it, it seems like, and you said earlier that you have to be the captain of your own ship. And last <coughs> night, um, Horacio um, and I had a fireside, there was no fire, but a fireside <laughs> chat with the Harvard Law and Business Association. And one of the things that I noticed about Horacio is that Although he was the captain of his own ship, he also was willing to let the ship sort of take him different places. And um, one of the things that I also noticed from his discussion about heart and about music that he didn't mention, that I'm going to share with you, so you've got to be careful what you tell me, yeah. <laughs> um, is he's actually kind of a, mus a musician at heart. He loves music. He played as a kid, he sang, he says he can't sing, but his daughters and his son, his two daughters and his son and his wife, evidently are fantastic uh, musicians and singers. And so I think that um, one of the, I remember when I was at Harvard, one of the hardest things about looking at your law career is how am I going to put all the pieces together of my life? How am I going to figure out my heart, you know, why you came to law school? I'm gonna, how am I going to use that and my creativity, which of course we as professors bang out of you over the three years or whatever, but how am I going to put all that together? And I guess, you know, in hearing Horacio speak last night and in talking to him, it, 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 and also in my, as I look at my own career in my 40s, it takes a lot of time to start putting all the pieces together. And you have to go to one piece and then another piece. And I just think, you know, I'm answering the question for him, but it just seems like Spotify was kismet. If you think about um, all the different things he did, he mentioned the three different reasons and the, the policy part, the data part, the technology part, but then the music part. It just sort of wraps it up neatly. <coughs> so understanding that, it puts you in a great position to lead as a general counsel of the company. But what do you think, how do you think your leadership role will be different at Spotify versus Microsoft? And what, what, what is your biggest fear, or what do you think is going to be the, the hardest thing about your new job? Um, well, there, look, there, the leadership has to adjust. I, I went from managing a team of over 800 people to managing a team of 40. So how you manage a team of 40 is very different. I actually find that refreshing, and I'm looking forward to it. It's probably a, a lot less meetings than I, than I would have to do than the ones that I was doing before. But the leadership style changes. The, um, the other thing that, that, that I think it's, uh, with, that goes without saying is the point that I was saying. is the opportunity to have the legal department play a voice in the strategic thinking of the company as it continues to develop its business model. You know, it's not only the relationship with the board, but also the working relationship with the CEO and the other senior leaders of the organization. Especially in a company that has as its core product one that is fundamentally associated with intellectual property and where the big inputs really have to do with the licensing in of the rights to the catalogs that artists and labels and publishers have. So there is an opportunity to bring creativity and innovation to how we deal with those things at the same time as the companies innovating business models and innovating the technology and the user interface and the personalization of the service. So there's all around an opportunity for innovation, including innovation on the part of the legal team. And that focusing on doing that um, is something that I'm, that I'm excited 
um, excited about it. In terms of the the look, there's the the thing when you when you work for for any startup, even one as uh, as established and 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 as much of a leader as Spotify is, um, you know, conditions can change, and and you know, the legal system needs to evolve, and if it doesn't evolve in the way that allows for this creativity and innovation uh, and entrepreneurial spirit to thrive because the legal environment doesn't create space for that, that could be a problem. It's not only a problem for all the companies in this space, but it could be, you know, at the end of the day, a great loss of, of value for <coughs> the users and the way they consume and they experience music which is why so much of the focus has to be on making sure that there's an environment in which all voices are heard as laws are changed and, and, uh, and cases are heard and things like that, but also that we work with the other stakeholders. Because always a, you know, a brokered solution among the stakeholders in the music industry is always going to be better than what, that one's, one that's imposed in the context of litigation or imposed by some politician somewhere. So trying to create those win-win situations are, is going to be a shared responsibility by everyone in the industry and within Spotify and other companies in the sector is going to be shared between the legal folks and the content licensing folks and the others. So um, that's you know that that is certainly a risk. But I I I went into this with my eyes open, knowing that there were risks involved, and and went because there were risks that needed to be managed and conquered. So on a more personal level, we mentioned, or I just said that I thought you were perfectly positioned for this position. I think you are. Probably everyone in this room thinks you are. But on a personal level, what is the pl where are you going to stretch yourself? What is your goal for yourself for personal growth as a leader and in-house counsel? Oh, that's, that's really interesting. I, I, I think my first area of focus, apart from from really knowing my team and, and just helping them. This is a team that, that uh, was without a general counsel for a number of months. So um, I think there's an opportunity to bring them together and make sure that they're operating at the right level. The, the other area is really understanding the business very deeply. And because as you understand, the, the, the function of the in-house lawyer is not just the typical legal function of providing a legal opinion and saying, well, on the one hand, you could do this. On the other hand, you could do this. And, Good luck, go, go do it. You really are, your skin's on the game. You're supposed to be able to make decisions and recommend courses of action. And in order to do that, you have to be very close to the business. You have to understand where they want to be. And then you, be, you need to be a partner with them in helping them get there. While maintaining your professional independence so that you can tell a business client, you know, when they're, they're about to do something that might cross an ethical or, or legal compliance guide. But, you know, that, that notion of partnership while maintaining professional independence um, is, uh, is really critical. And, uh, and, and, and here at Spotify, it'll be on my shoulders to, to, to be able to have the team fulfill those, that dual role. So this is something that might um, be important to this group, because how many of you out there um, plan to work at a law firm? Okay. So we, you, you mentioned some of the differences between being an in-house attorney and working at a law firm. What, are the, what, is like the, what is the one thing, or if you wanted to do a couple things, about working at a law firm that helps you be a better in-house attorney? Well, you look, look in, in law firms, and I worked at a law firm before coming to Microsoft, you have the opportunity to go deep. The law firm time is one in which you, at the same time as you're working for a client, you're really going really deep on, a, on certain areas and you're building your subject matter expertise uh, in the area. And, and if you're lucky, you'll be working on things that are bet the company type of issues, whether it be some big litigation or class action suit or some antitrust uh, proceeding or, or some huge patent litigation or um, you know, mergers and acquisitions types of corporate events that change the, the face of the company. But what happens and the typical complaint that I hear from, from outside counsel is they get to jump in into an issue, 
they're involved intensely for a, a brief period of time, and then they pull out and they lose, lose track of where things go. And they complain that they wish they, they stayed connected or they wish they had gotten involved a little earlier. So uh, the flip side of that is the advantage of being in-house is you actually participate in the full arc of an issue from the moment in which it is being conceived by the business leader and then you have an opportunity to influence that and almost anticipate legal issues that are going to happen uh, later. And it's a lot easier to change them in the beginning than it is to try to like ret retrofit a solution later on once your business clients are really committed to going in a certain direction. So that's the advantage of it. The disadvantage of being in-house, as I said, is you don't get to just tell them, hey, here's the legal analysis, go do it. They will hold you accountable. They will say, no, you tell me what you think I, uh, I need to do, and then I'll do it. And you need to be comfortable to, uh, with, uh, with the consequences of that, including the fact that sometimes you will make mistakes. And that, in fact, you know, and then it's a good thing you're there for the full arc, because you're going to have to clean up at the end the mess that, that you helped create in the beginning. So how many of you, after you work at a law firm, think you might eventually join um, some type of um, organization in-house, whether it's the government or a corporation? Okay, great. So given that we have a group of people that are likely going to work at law firm and then go in-house, what is the one or two pieces of advice you'd, you'd, you'd give this group? Um, I, as much as one should focus on continuing our, our, uh, one's own continuing legal education, um, it, it is really critical for people to maintain, um, have a sort of wide angle view of what's happening in the industry. Whatever industry you're interested in, um, just keeping up to speed on what's happening in the, in the technology front, in the business front, in the competitive front, Maintaining that perspective is really important. I've always said that the outside counsel that I've been most impressed with when they've come to pitch me business or because of the relationships that I have with them are the ones that really don't need much of an education about the environment. They understand the environment. Sometimes they're the ones who, who will send me a piece, of article, a piece of news that might have come up in France that said, you know, the government's starting this or these companies are thinking of merging or things like that. They have this awareness of the environment that, that is really critical because they know what information is relevant for you <coughs> in-house. So the ability to keep that, you know, if you say your, your area of interest is entertainment law or sports law or, you know, international law or whatever it is, just developing this broad culture um, and, you know, is staying informed and up to speed with, with macro developments. That, that are influencing the environment for a particular area is, is, is probably the biggest thing I, I, I would recommend. Fantastic. So we'd like to open it up to questions from, from, from all of you. Any questions? Yes. So just following up a little bit on, on the relationship with sort of the external providers of legal services, one of the things that's been happening over the last 10 years is that there are lots more kinds of people who provide legal services to corporations than, than just law firms, large <coughs> and small. And if you read the American Lawyer, you imagine that they're ready to take over the world. But when you read corporate counsel, you think maybe not so much. And the question I have is- They're both right. <laughs> how Well, actually, what I'd like you to do is explain that answer. How is it they're both right, and what's happening now, and what do you see happening in terms of a more complicated ecosystem going forward? Um, well, I, you know, the, the legal profession is, um, is one that is um, notoriously slow to change. Um, and certainly the law firm um, environment, as much as it's been subject to tremendous stress um, over the last decade or so, um, you know, you still see, uh, you know, the remnants of the same business model that, that has been there. I, I, I've always, I'm always blown away by the fact that we continue to live in a world where, even as alternative fee arrangements have uh, started to come up, that the fundamental method for compensation of law firms is one that rewards inefficiency. The more hours you build, the more money you make as opposed to rewarding efficiency. Can you have a high quality product that's generated in a shorter amount of time and, and everyone wins? 
So you're starting to see some of those changes take place, and, and you're starting to see uh, innovation when it comes to model for the delivery of legal services. Uh, some of them are because of business considerations, some of them are technology enabled, and, and I think we're at just at the beginning of the, we're at the nascent stage of those uh, alternative models. Some of the things that we experimented with at Microsoft, um, we had something called the virtual firm that we used in, in, uh, uh, in especially in patent prosecution. Microsoft invents, invests a tremendous amount of money in developing and maintaining a patent portfolio worldwide, and we found that uh, there, uh, it was very expensive to use traditional firms to do that, and it was also expensive to try to have in-house people, and that there was this whole segment of the legal services population that were lawyers who had great experiences with some of the top firms, but for a number of reasons, either wanted to move part-time or wanted to move to some, you know, some <coughs> parts of the country outside of the major legal centers. And then we set out to create a model in which we would provide some of the administrative setup to allow very small firms and even solo practitioners in St. Louis and in Kansas and in a number of other places. These might have been lawyers who were at Cleary or, or Morrison and Forster or, or other firms there and, 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 and basically they were the backbone and, or, of a lot of the patent uh, preparation and filing and prosecution work that we did. And they got compensation that was incredibly competitive uh, in the market in which they were, but we were able to achieve savings of a third of the cost of, uh, of the filing of a, of a patent, for example. Uh, so there's a variety of new models. That, that is just one example of something that was done that was differently, and then you, have, you, you continue to see experimentation in terms of how lawyers come together to provide legal services and the networks that are being created. And I think technology and, and, uh, you know, will, will really play a big role in helping you know, that transformation going forward. And I, I don't think it will supplant the need for large established law firms. Not every legal matter is created equal. They need different things. There will be, you know, when you're working on a huge merger and acquisition transaction or you're doing the IPO of a company or you have a, you know, class action litigation, you absolutely have a responsibility as an in-house counsel, a responsibility to your, to your leadership and to your board to hire the firm that has the depth and the expertise in order to do it. So, but, but not every legal matter requires um, the level of overhead and, and cost of that demand. So what I'm saying is they, they both are right because in the end you're going to end up with a blend and hopefully with, with choice in terms of the level of service and the kind of uh, legal service providers that you will choose depending on the, on the nature of the matter. So my question is probably more for those who are more interested in getting into an in-house position earlier rather than later. So I was wondering what kind of methods or opportunities you would recommend one such person to look out for or take starting as soon as being a student in law school. Well, I think one of the great opportunities is more and more um, uh, legal departments have uh, you know summer internship uh, opportunities, and I've had. Um, when I, during my time at Microsoft, I had some wonderful uh, summer associates that, that came and worked with me and with other people in the department, and some really interesting things. And you really get to know them fairly well. They spend a lot of time, there's a lot of social activities around the, the programs that, that you actually get to know them well, and then you get to work on specific issues, so you, you get a pretty good sense of, of their capabilities as a legal thinker and as a writer and, and things like that. So taking advantage of opportunities like that is really important. I don't think um, in the corporate world we do enough of that. I'm, I, I, I am, I'm a believer that summer internships are not sufficient. And I wish over time we move to more of an apprenticeship model where people, you know, instead of clerking for a judge, they, they had the opportunity to clerk in a clerk in a, in, a, in a legal 
uh, department, I think that would create more opportunities for people to stay, call it a fellowship or an apprenticeship or whatever that is. I think, uh, I wish we had moved sooner uh, into things like that, especially, uh, you know, over the last seven to ten years as the, as the legal market really went through a shock and, 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 uh, and had to adjust uh, itself. And, and, and that is one of the things that I certainly will want to promote and work with other industries to, to do. Then the, the other thing is, um, I, I think the world of the startups is a great opportunity. I mean, uh, the reality is I, I see in smaller companies a willingness to bet on a young talent which exceeds the willingness that I've seen in larger companies. Larger companies would tend to hire people that are, you know, fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth year associates or even partners in law firms coming over or people who come laterally from other companies, much less in terms of college hiring. There is virtually no uh, law school hiring that's happening in large legal departments. It's, you can, you can you maybe sort of track them with the, you know, one hand the companies that have programs like that. So there will be more opportunities, I think, um, in the future, especially because the nature of the topics, the challenges are so new. And you're all being exposed to those things in the academic environment, to all these global challenges and, and you know, heavy technology-related challenges and, and, and cross-border regulatory issues that, um, that those of us who didn't have that experience in school have had to learn gradually over the years, but I, I actually think there is great value in hiring uh, people either out of law school or, or shortly out of law school uh, into legal departments. And I think startups will have, I think, the courage to do that, uh, in part because, you know, the culture of the place <coughs> is such that, you know, they're, they're doing the same thing in, with computer scientists graduating from engineering school and from other places, so from a cultural perspective would be a good fit. Okay. You had a question? Yes. So you have framed today's talk in terms of a perspective from an in-house counsel. Yeah. And your very interesting professional life lessons are couched in the context of, of how to succeed in a large corporate legal environment. So I'm going to invite you and speculate on the following. Because mm -hmm. you know something about law firms, yes. right? But having worked there and having worked with a lot of M Law 200 firms, how would your lessons of your 10 lessons about leadership and career development be different if you were speaking not to future in-house lawyers, but to future law firm lawyers? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I don't know that I've put us, obviously I haven't put any thought of that. It's a hard question. There, there are some things that I, that I, let me just elaborate on a couple points that I started making earlier. The relationship piece is really important. I, I, I said the lawyers that I've always been the most impressed by are those who, whether they have an active matter on which they're billing you, or whether they don't at a particular time, they stay in contact, they stay informed, they maintain a relationship, and they're, you know, I, I find them, that some of them have this knack for finding the right moment to give you a call and check, or dropping by and have a conversation, and, and you know that they're trying to learn what's, what's high in your mind, what's, what are your priorities, what are the challenges that you have, and then they use that information to figure out how can they be helpful. And they don't do that in a pushy, obnoxious way. They do that in a very organic way. And I, I, I have a few of those in mind, and I, I actually think it takes a remarkable talent. But those are the people that when you have an issue that's a gnarly issue, one in which you need a trusted <coughs> advisor, not someone who will go and write a memo, but someone who you can go bounce an idea off of, those are the people that one thinks about. Because you don't have to bring them up to speed, or, or not much. Uh, these are people that, that, that have, an, it, have always maintained an interest and are well informed about the nature of the issues that you have. The other thing is, in my experience in law firms, and, and I know some firms have done a good job in overcoming this, um, and this is in part dictated by the compensation model and all of those things, but you know, making sure firms are, are, are uh, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. That is the notion that um, the individual lawyer doesn't have to be the hero that will deliver all the services and get all the credit with the client, 
but that sometimes they can simply orchestrate the creation of a team within the law firm to provide the best service in the most efficient way and they don't feel the need to be in the middle of all communications between the firm and the client. It goes back to the notion of leaders being team players. This notion that law firms should be a team and the expertise within the firm should be viewed as a, as a team uh, set of expertise. And, and, but yet that is not very, it doesn't come in naturally in the law firm environment. People are very protective of their client relationships and they want to stay in between and be the, the curator. Uh, it's sometimes for, for good reasons, that is they want to ensure the service is being provided the right quality. There are other ways of ensuring that. So I think I, certainly those are two things that I, as, uh, when I look at, at, at partners in law firms that I, that I think get it right in terms of how to properly integrate with their clients, but also that you can see have a really healthy dynamic in terms of the relationship with others in their own firm, they really are good at doing those two things. Back there. Oh, I know that you started out, <coughs> thank you very much for talking again today. Um, I know that you started your career at Microsoft uh, in, as like a LATAM GC. And I was curious what skills you learned from being like a GC in that specific kind of region and how that helped you later on. And what advice would you give to someone who would possibly be interested in being an in house counsel for a company that's an emerging market? What kind of <coughs> specific challenges and hurdles that you see for people with that community? Yeah, I, I, so when I started in 98, it was uh, for all of Latin America and the Caribbean, except for Brazil, that was my, my region. How all Spanish, Latin America, and the Caribbean, it was me and a paralegal. And, <laughs> and, uh, and that was exciting. It was basically, I was involved on you know, a tax audit in Chile, the lease of the first Microsoft subsidiary in Guatemala, the huge software licensing deal with Pemex, the oil, the government owned uh, 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 oil company in Mexico, um, electronic signatures issues and all those kinds of things. You, get, you got to do a little bit of everything. What that does is, what you get is you become, you have to be very resourceful. You have to do a lot with very little. And interestingly, that's kind of the skill set that it takes to be a successful lawyer in a, in a startup. You have to be a little bit of everything. There's no lines and boundaries. And I, I've been blown away. You know, I've been at Spotify for one week. One of the things that I find terrific is there's this uh, email distribution list and people from all over the world, the business people or the engineers or the tax people, or they just send questions there to legal, right? And the decision as to who will feel the question has a lot more to do with who has time that day than it has to do with the, with the area of expertise. And I find that really exhilarating. And it tells you something about the mindset uh, that it takes to do that. And certainly in the emerging market, you have to have that mindset. Uh, the, the nature of the issues are somewhat different than you find in, in the developed markets. And then Increasingly, you all, you also, I think, and I, I speak as a, you know, I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in Latin America. I, I think I can say this. You know, the some of the ethical issues in the way the business is conducted, um, they require a lot of attention on the part of the in-house lawyers and having uh, the ability to ask the right questions as to why deals are being done in a certain way. Um, it is really uh, it is really important. So maintaining that the ability to be an enabler of the business so they can achieve their success, but at the same time being aware that you're operating in an environment in which you know partner relationships and consultants and vendors may not be what you think they're going to be, and you need to watch out for for uh, ethical behavior. Uh, it's really important. So you really have to to develop as a holistically as a, as a legal counsel and know when you need to go seek the resource, the, the, the support of, of experts, but, but essentially be, being able to operate on your own. So that, that, that self-reliance and that resourceful, resourcefulness and initiative are things that, that are uniquely valuable in that environment. You had a question? 
Yeah, I'm really uh, intrigued by the, the transition you're, you're in right now. It seems super challenging and fun and exciting. And I'm wondering, do you see yourself, or to what degree do you see yourself now sort of importing the experience and the, you know, the Microsoft legal department way to your new position? Or do you see this more as a, um, an opportunity to experiment, to try things that you weren't able to do at Microsoft, or that a new environment and new team allows you to, to pursue that you couldn't before? Yeah, look, I, I, I've, from the very first moment, I've been very clear that to attempt to bring the Microsoft legal structures and processes into Spotify would be a tremendous mistake. Um, first of all, it wasn't perfect. It is not, no organization is perfect. But second, it is a, an incredibly well-resourced organization where you know, you're not going to be able to have those, those same resources in Spotify even if you wanted to. But on the other hand, I actually think there is something to be said for the notion of having a very entrepreneurial uh, team that's willing to experiment and who's much more flexible about roles and responsibilities. So as, yes, there, there are things that come from my experience having been you know, a lawyer in, in Europe and Middle East and Africa and having worked in Asia and having worked in Latin America and being a lawyer in the US, I've seen a lot and that's the benefit of experience is I can offer that perspective as we tackle challenges in Spotify. But from the point of view of the workings of the legal department and the culture of the legal department, my goal is to try to preserve it, even as we create, you know, minimal sets of structures designed to make them more effective, as opposed to structures and processes that are going to get in the way of them doing their work. So if anything, I am more in the learning mode at this point than I am in the mode of let me, let me teach you how to run this department. These people have been running the department without me for a few months. And clients are very happy and the company is doing really well. So they must be doing something right. They don't need me to come in and shake everything up and reinvent everything. If anything, I need to learn what's working. And I need to tune into the culture of the company and the department. And then organically, in the areas in which it makes sense, add the process and uh, the structure that, that, that is reasonable. Maybe one more question, and then we'll wrap. So thank you once again for your talk. In the beginning, you were talking about one of the goals of Spotify is to change the music business in a responsible way. And one of the great things about Spotify is it just provides access to people to anywhere in an extensive catalog. Uh, one of the big trends is you're seeing other you know services like Tidal or Apple Music sign exclusive deals for certain songs. And the more exclusive deals there are, less music that's on a competing service. So. I know it's only one week into it, but do you have you know, initial thoughts on pursuing exclusive deals with uh, certain music companies or record labels and things of that nature? Well, it's only been one week. <laughs> and th I think this is one question in which I, I think I probably, I probably shouldn't comment about it. I, obviously, I think the goal of Spotify is to have the broadest catalog possible so that you know, the music that people want to hear, they can hear. Um, this is this is early days for the streaming music industry. Um, we actually think that competition in this space is good. I think it validates the streaming market as a whole, and uh, and and sort of it validates the bet that that Spotify has made on the, on the streaming of uh, of music. Uh, but it is a very competitive landscape, and and uh, you know we expect it to continue to be so. And uh, as to the exclusive deals, you know, I wish they were all signing with Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you very much. Thank you so much.